is 863177. All right, Ms. Maxfield. Good morning, Your Honor. Lisa Maxfield here with Ms. Rolke. My phone number is 844-227, and my last name is spelled M-A-X-F-I-E-L-D. All right, so before we bring in the jury this morning, I was told there was a matter that defense wanted to bring up. Hold on a second. I need to make sure my phone is quiet. All right, I'm sorry. I was forwarded a case, State v. Carter, at 315 or at 246, a 2021 opinion, and I did have a chance to read it. So, Ms. Maxfield, I will let you bring up your issue. Thank you, Your Honor. I needed to turn my phone off, too, so let me put myself back together. Your Honor, we're just offering the case, the Carter case, to the court because I had some concerns yesterday as Detective Merrill talked about our client's demeanor during the police interrogation. I think what Carter says is it's okay for a witness to describe the demeanor. What's not okay is for the witness to then draw conclusions from the demeanor. For example, I think, and I have counsel may remember this more specifically than I do, but I think that what he said was that our client was not typical of how a person behaved during a death notification. I think that's where the testimony went too far. I don't remember objecting. If I did, I'll cheer myself on in the transcript, but I just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to venture over that line again today. Okay. All right. And did the state have a chance to read the opinion? I read most of it. Okay. All right. And I think I got the crux of what the ruling was in that case. And it does seem to speak to what the officer's opinion was on whether somebody should have reacted a certain way based on whether they were guilty or innocent. I don't think we crossed that line yesterday. I think that it was limited to what my question really was getting at was, was Ms. Brophy seem confused or anything during that interaction? And there was an objection at some point during the answer to that, and we sort of moved on. And really what I settled on for the question with Detective Merrill was, did she seem oriented to time and space? And I think there's nothing in the case law that suggests I can't ask that or whether she seemed confused or anything. I agree with counsel that I think that case says that the detective would not be able to opine that that was a normal reaction or not. But I don't think he did that. In fact, I think if anything, my memory was that he actually said that it was a normal reaction, that she seemed upset at times and kind of scattered. But that was normal for people that are just being notified of a loved one's death. So I have a different memory, I think, as to what the detective actually said. And if anything, that probably helps defense, I think, based on that reaction, that this is a normal reaction or seemingly that it wasn't over the top or anything. And so, but I'm certainly not going to, I think, if the question is moving forward, are we going to get into that testimony? I don't intend to. I mean, my only real question for the detective regarding the interview at this point is, was there any contradictory statements that she made? That's just a factual question, though. Did she say something and then later in the interview contradict that statement? I'm not asking his opinion on that or what he thought about that, just did that happen? And then really, we're kind of moving on at this point. Okay. Well, and just so everyone knows, my memory on this topic was there was an objection to the question of whether or not Ms. Brophy seemed confused during the interview. I overruled the objection, and I continue to think that that was the correct ruling. There was a point in time, and I don't remember what the question was, but I did paraphrase the answer, which was the detective testified that she seemed reasonably acting like a person would act when being told their loved one dies, seemed lucid with sequence of morning events, details about a sink when she woke up, et cetera, alert and in bed. In my opinion, she had a lot of details, and she seemed oriented. 
So I don't believe he gave an answer to indicate that her reaction was not in accord with how a person would behave. I think it's pretty clear that at the end of the interview, at that point, they did not consider her a suspect. Uh, however, uh, having read the opinion, I would just ask counsel to be careful to make sure that the questions that you ask and the detective's testimony do not veer into the type of inappropriate commentary that was given in that case. But I, I would agree with the state. I don't think that has occurred to this point. Uh, so with that, is there anything else before we bring in the jury? I would suggest we bring in Detective Merrill. I'll remind him he's under oath from yesterday and just have him seated and ready to go. So, Detective Morello, I'm not sure if you were in here when I said that or not, but you were made to the from yesterday. Sure. Okay, we are ready for the jury. Let's go off record. Yeah, let's go off the record. Uh, we will go off record and we will meet for what next? We're going to continue the testimony of Detective Merrill. Uh, when you're ready, Mr. Overstreet. So, Detective Merrill, uh, where we left off yesterday, um, we had concluded the uh, death notification with Mrs. Brophy. Uh, and then I had asked you a couple of questions about how she see whether or not she seemed confused or not during the course of that interview. Uh, and you, you had indicated that she did not. I had a follow-up question to that. Um, at any time during the interview, specifically as she's 
describing the events of that morning. Um, was there any time during the various times in which she's describing those events that she ever really contradicted herself, or did she seem to sort of stay in line with the, her story? Uh, yeah, it seemed she stayed in line and she was consistent with her story. I, I remember Detective Posey uh, conducted a line of questioning, gathering information from uh, Ms. Crampton Brophy. I later came in later in the interview when uh, Detective Posey asked if I had any questions. I revisited the sequence of events from that morning to her um, memory, and she was consistent with uh, she was at home in bed. Uh, uh, she would she didn't sleep well the night before. She woke up at about 6:45 a.m. to 6:50 a.m. in bed, was alert and awake because uh, Dan had come up to get a shower. She had this conversation. Uh, you know, she remembered details about that morning talking to Dan about a leak under the sink and then remembered him getting dressed and leaving uh, for work at approximately 7.05 to 7.10 a.m. And so uh, to... Here, I would object to the characterization. The tape speaks for itself. I think what Ms. Brophy does is reconstruct the time that he typically left for work. Um, well, I'll let the answer stand and the jury could rely on its memory for uh, what was said. Your Honor, I, I object to the characterization of the question. That is wildly inaccurate. She is not recounting what well, she I, I've already I've already ruled that the jury can rely on their own memory of what was said. So I don't know if you can really object to an objection. <laughs> so I, I'm going to have you continue. And, and Your Honor, I guess just for the record, I'm, I'm, what I'm objecting to is defense counsel's ob putting objections on the record that are simply not factually accurate. That's what I'm objecting to. Right. Well, both sides will have different memories about what was said, and the jury may have yet another memory. So I'm We'll continue. Uh, okay, Detective. So uh, just one other question on the interview, and then we're going to move on to another subject. And specifically, I'm not just talking about the recording. Any conversation that happened after the interview specifically is what I'm uh, getting at here. So not necessarily part of the recording. During the recording, we cannot clearly hear that she discloses that she bought this gun at the gun show. Correct, yes. Uh, in your memory, and obviously listening to the recording, did she disclose any other firearm purchases to you? No. Okay. And specifically discussing after when the recording is not running, was there any discussion on her part uh, disclosing any other firearm purchases? No, the only discussion was the one that she mentioned and that uh, we, were, we were offering her assistance to get her home and escort her home. Uh, with Detective Scott Broad and Detective Rico Beniga assisting her, and to also um, collect the handgun that she specifically told us about, the gun show gun, uh, to make sure that it was there that Dan hadn't brought to work. We were concerned that maybe he actually brought it to work that day and was shot with his own gun because we couldn't figure out any other motive of what happened that day uh, because it didn't look like, as I've said, a burglary, a robbery. Uh, there were no grudges against Dan that we could find at that point. Okay. And so was that kind of the scope of the discussion after the recording stops, once you're outside with Ms. Brophy, was that kind of the scope of the discussion about going to collect this firearm? Well, one, making sure that it's there, but then also to collect the firearm. Correct. Uh, and, you know, there was a time where she spent some time with the TIPS volunteer to assist her while we coordinated with uh, Detective Broughton um, and Detective Beniga to assist her getting home. Um, and then the conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, that's correct. It was about getting her home, uh, checking on the gun with her consent, and collecting it for safekeeping. And <clears throat> to that point, uh, at this point, now that uh, you've, you've done the scene investigation, at least preliminarily, and you've spoken with Miss Brophy, and now you're assisting her in getting home and to look for this firearm. At that point, before you've watched any for video, before you've talked to other people, was Miss Brophy a suspect in your mind? 
No, absolutely not. I'm, you know, we spent great time and patience trying to uh, comfort her, make sure she's safe, that she's going to get home safely. Uh, you know, uh, we wanted to make sure um, that there wasn't, you know, anything. You know, her driving home under those conditions could have been maybe possibly unsafe for her. She could have been emotional. She was emotional. So we wanted to make sure that was taken care of, at least offer that assistance. Um, so at that point, what we considered Ms. Crampton Brophy was a grieving spouse that just learned her husband had been brutally murdered by a handgun. Uh, and we felt, we felt compassion for her. We felt sad for her. I think you can hear that in the interview. Um, and we wanted to make sure she was OK. And uh, to that end, you said part of the idea of taking her back home, obviously for safety reasons and uh, things like that, but you, you're also talking about the collection of a firearm. Why at that point, wh what decision was made or what discussion occurred that led to the belief that the police were going to be collecting the firearm, if it's not because she's a suspect? Um, mainly because we wanted to make sure it was there. Like I said before, we wanted to make sure maybe Dan didn't decide there's something that we didn't know about or that uh, Ms. Crampton Brophy didn't know about that he thought he needed a gun that morning. Uh, you know, just wanted to make sure. Um, and the other part of this is, you know, there were parts during the contact with Ms. Crampton Brophy that she was afraid of that, that item. She didn't even want it. Uh, and that we would go collect it for safekeeping. But also, as part of a complete objective investigation, uh, she told us it was a Glock semi-automatic handgun, and uh, we did know uh, that we had uh, semi-automatic spent casings at our scene. We want to rule that gun out uh, also as part of the overall investigation to show that, well, yeah, we looked at this gun. Uh, it either is or not connected to this investigation as part of a complete overall investigation. Okay. And uh, in your uh, interactions with Ms. Brophy, did she seem to want you to take the firearm? That's the uh, feeling I, I got, yes. That she, uh, I think there was a point where she actually said, uh, you can take the thing. I don't even want it. Something to that effect, similar to that. And you've, you've mentioned the term a couple of times now, safekeeping. Is that mm -hmm. different than uh, an item that's collected as evidence? Yes, it is. Okay. Could you explain the difference? Uh, yes, so an, an evidentiary item that we seize, uh, is sent to our usually sent to our property evidence room or sent maybe for testing or something of that nature, but it's not something that's going to get immediately re released until a disposition in that investigation. Uh, safekeeping is where we still take that property, but with the consent of the owner. Um, and there's a possibility that that item might maybe returned at a later date. Sure, during the. If, if that's being kept for safekeeping and the owner asks for it back, it's possible that, unless it's become a piece of evidence, that they, you would return the item. Unless things change and it becomes a piece of evidence, that's correct. We would, uh, otherwise we may return it back if the owner wanted it back. Okay. And at, from the time that this firearm was collected for safekeeping uh, to the time of Ms. Brophy's arrest, um, did she ever make a request to you or Detective Posey that you're aware of to have the firearm returned? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, OK, so you, <clears throat> you're talking about coordinating with Detective Broughton and Detective Beniga. Um, what was sort of the plan that you guys came up with? I know you briefly talked about it already, but just kind of summarize what the plan was that morning. Yes. Um, uh, as I remember it, uh, Ms. Crampton Brophy, uh, as I mentioned before, was talking to a TIPS volunteer to get resource information as a grieving uh, victim in this case, a spouse. And we conferred with Detective Scott Broughton, Detective Rico Beniga, they're homicide uh, detectives that work with us. They had responded to the scene to assist in the investigation. Um, we asked them if they were willing to accompany. Initially, it was just to accompany Ms. Crampton Brophy. Uh, they were going to follow her home. Uh, and then look at the gun and collect that. And uh, as they were walking over towards the van, I recall that um, there was a question about, would you just like uh, Detective Broughton to drive you home? And that uh, Ms. Crampton Brophy accepted that offer. Okay. 
And uh, you talked a little bit yesterday about seeing Miss Brophy's van downtown that morning. Correct. Um, we're going to show you what's marked as States Exhibit 40 here in a moment. Uh, so if you could look at your screen there, we're going to zoom in a little bit on this photograph. Do you recognize this photograph, first of all? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, if you recognize Miss Brophy's uh, minivan in this photograph, could you uh, indicate where it is? And you could use the pointer and point to the larger screen. Sure. So this is a this is a photo of the intersection of South Southwest 17th Avenue and Jefferson Street. Uh, you can see just also here. Chef Brophy's truck, uh, OCI is right next to his truck. This is Jefferson Street here, running east and west. 17th Avenue, running north and south. And this is uh, the business we referred to earlier, uh, Potluck in the Park, I believe it's called, where they feed, uh, they have a homeless, uh, they feed homeless individuals. And this van right here is Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan, the Toyota Sienna 2010 grayish van. And just to be clear, this is a photograph that was taken after Ms. Brophy returned to downtown that morning. Right. This is uh, part of our, our criminalists, our, of our forensic evidence division, who respond with us, documenting the crime scene, taking photographs of everything they think you know, could help the whole entire area, basically, the perimeter. And do you recall personally observing uh, Miss Brophy's van in that location specifically? I do, yes. Uh, Your Honor, at this point, the state would move to admit State's Exhibit 40. No objection. No objection. Okay, uh, 40 is admitted. Uh, before I move on with my questioning, before so we don't forget here, I'd move to admit State's Exhibit 3A and accompanying Exhibit 3B, uh, 3A being the recording of defendant's interview, uh, the death notification, and 3B being a transcript of that interview. Um, no objection. All right, uh, 3A and 3B are admitted as well. So, Detective, uh, after Detective Broughton and Detective Benega left, uh, they take Miss Brophy, her minivan, and they head off to the house. Correct. Uh, where did you go at that point? To, uh, Detective Posey and I um, started to walk around that intersection a little bit, and we we had been uh, given information that there might be a um, video resource. Uh, camera video resources at one of the restaurants on set on Jefferson Street just across the street from OCI So we walked over there. This is Bellagio's Bellagio's pizza restaurant and As I walked over with detective Posey, I could actually see through the window You could see the cameras inside that face towards the window. So uh, Bellagio's is on the uh, south side of Southwest Jefferson Street um, OCI is on the north side, so it's just across the street and just a little further to the west. So we went to um, the Bellagio's restaurant. We talked to a manager and uh, received uh, permission to view the video. And we walked back. Uh, the, the manager set up the video for us. The manager informed us that this video timestamp is three hours fast. So. The time we were looking at at that moment was three hours fast than actual time. Uh, it was set for Eastern Standard Time. So, uh, so we began looking at the video going back to the time frame around 7-ish a.m. basically. And as we were looking at the video, I believe the first video image we saw, well, we watched several minutes, we saw there's always a lot of activity it seemed like every few moments where there's either somebody walking by people going to Starbucks uh, looked like people were getting off uh, the max at times and moving by um, and then at about approximately with the time adjustment 728 a.m. I believe is the first image we saw of 
a minivan driving by directly in front of Bellagio's Pizza restaurant. Uh, and it actually went fairly slow so you could get a good image of it. And I remember we all uh, kind of paused and I believe it was Detective Posey who initially said, does that look like, you know, we, we were like, that looks like Nancy Crampton Brophy's van, the one we just saw, the one we just saw her get driven away and with uh, Detective Scott Broughton. So then we began to look at it, pause it, you know, take our time with it, look at it more. And we were pretty sure it looked exactly like it. We were shocked because we we're thinking maybe there's something wrong at the time. And this is just when she first, when she came down to get notified, maybe the time is not correct and we need to figure this out. Um, we continued to look at it and it appeared it was not wrong. The time frame appeared to be correct. Um, and there was an image of the driver in the van that looked very consistent to me, in my opinion, of Nancy Crampton Brophy as well. Um, short grayish hair, uh, appeared a little older, um, with some sort of a dark colored garment on top. Um, so at that point, you know, we, we, we have to figure this out. This is something we can't ignore. We have to confront it, deal with it. So I realized Detective Rico Benega, as we just mentioned, Detective Scott Broughton had just driven Miss Crampton Brophy in her van to her house. So I called Detective Rico Benega and I asked him to take photographs, if he could, of, De of Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan so we could compare it to make sure what we were seeing is what we thought it was. We're going to show you a photograph here. So we're going to show you uh, a still um, capture from what's marked as State's Exhibit 9, the video from Bellagio's. So, Detective, I know you kind of described this just through testimony, but can you kind yes. of describe what we're seeing in this photograph, what you were viewing at that time? So this is, uh, you can see the timestamp and the date in the upper right corner. Uh, June 2nd, 2018, the date of our incident. Uh, you can see it's daylight. You can see the timestamp says 10.08.44 a.m. Again, we were informed by the management, um, and we also later had this video collected by one of our forensic uh, video uh, technicians, who was Officer Aaron Sparling, and he confirmed it was three hours fast as well. And we looked at our, at our own um, phones at the time. We were looking at the interview to compare to the actual time versus the time on the video and it was three hours fast and detective before we, we move on with that you had just testified about the time being 7 28 the video we're viewing now obviously says 10 08 you've already said it's three hours fast so being 7 08 yeah so two different times can you describe that please so we end up we ended up the first visual we had this van to my recollection was the 7 28 a.m which would be then on their timestamp 10 28 AM. The image we're looking at right at right now is the second image we see of this van, which is earlier when we continue to spend more time with the video and go back in time. We found the van come by again earlier at 7.08 AM. So that would be 10.08 on the uh, three hour fast timestamp on their video. So that's the image we're looking at right now. As I look at this uh, picture, this is exactly what I was describing to you earlier. The camera's inside Bellagio's. It films directly out the window. Uh, obviously, their entrance, probably for security reasons. And it captures um, moving traffic, pedestrians that walk by. That's Jefferson Street. Jefferson Street is one way, as I think I, we mentioned earlier, a one-way street going westbound. Uh, at that point, there's two lanes there. Uh, the lane that that vehicle in is the inner uh, lane closest to Bellagio's to the south. There's another lane, one over 
past the bike path that you see there, the green uh, path. So there's another lane, it's a turning lane over to the top of that image. Um, the van, as you can see, uh, and after we compared it to the photographs we received from Detective Rico Beniga, uh, looked exactly the same as Nancy Crampton Brophy's van. Um, the same color, the tinted windows, the same wheel configuration, the same body style, uh, the same roof racks. Um, and again, we spent a lot of time with this. You're seeing one still image. There's more images as it first appeared to the right. And we would take this, stop it, slow it down, compare it carefully. Then um, we did a lot of things where we would uh, zoom in on the photographs on our own just to make sure we weren't missing anything. I would even take a magnifying glass, literally a magnifying glass, and look at my monitor with it to get a closer image to see what I was looking at. And everything matched uh, from this van to Nancy Crampton Brophy's actual Toyota Sienna 2010 minivan. And then as we look closer at the driver, uh, the driver looks extremely consistent with Nancy Crampton Brophy. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first image in time chronologically, but the second image that we saw that morning, um, we saw the 728 image first. But the point I'm trying to make here is that van wasn't just a van that drove by once, it drove by multiple times, twice. Uh, so not like just a normal commuter that's on their way, you know, wants to get it to, to work on time or whatever they're doing on a Saturday morning at 7.08 in the morning. It came by a second time, 7.28. So it became, you know, something that, you know, we can't ignore. We have to investigate. We're kind of in shock because we believe this is Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan now. We're going to show you what's marked as States Exhibit 155. I'm sorry, 115, 115. Um, could you tell us what we're looking at in this photograph? Yes. Do you mind if I use the pointer? Yes, please. Okay. So this is a photograph that Detective Rico Beniga took at Nancy Crampton Brophy's driveway at her house that morning after they drove her there, after I called him and asked him to take some photos of the van. This is the uh, driver's side rear quarter panel, just below the, uh, the uh, gas cap and above the wheel well. There's a very distinctive scratch defect here that has rust in it that's older. So a distinctive uh, mark on the vehicle. Okay. And when you, when you received this video, or I'm sorry, this photograph, um, were you still at Bellagio's reviewing video? We were, yes. Okay. Were you able to take this photograph and kind of side by side compare it to what you were seeing in the Blagio's video if you were to pause it? Yes. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us what you were seeing that either was visually consistent or was not? We, we believed we saw that morning something that was similar to a defect on the side of the van. But um, I would say we spent a lot more time with that back at the office where we're doing zoom in features, we're, we're slowing it down a lot more, looking at it on a bigger monitor and taking a much longer look at it where we then start to realize later that we're pretty sure it has that same exact defect. And at this point, we'd move to admit States Exhibit 115, 115. No objection. All right, uh, 115 is admitted. So, Detective, we've talked about. We can take that. Uh, Detective, we talked about um, all this video that we have identified on uh, States Exhibit 96 here. Um, and actually, I'm sorry. Before we move on, I want to clarify something. I think you said that the minivan was a 2010. Um, yes, I'm mistaken. Uh, I think it's 2005. Actually, I think the Toyota. Tacoma truck that belonged to Dan Brophy was 2010. I apologize. Okay, so the, the van 2005, the pickup truck 2010. I believe that's correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for clarifying. 
Uh, so we talked about video on this board, States Exhibit 96, the different location. You indicated the direction of, of the view of the camera. Uh, but I want to talk about a couple of them specifically. But before I do that, um, the canvas for video was much wider than this. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it was. And did you actually collect more video than what is uh, being presented today? Yes, we collected a lot more. And um, in all of the video that was collected, did you observe Ms. Brophy's van in all of the video? Uh, not in all the video, no. Okay. And so are you zeroed in on this kind of core area around the Culinary Institute where we're focusing the video? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I want to have you just, I want to discuss with you the KGW video, the one on the map that's farthest to the right. Um, we've talked about time discrepancies, things like that, but is there something uh, unusual or I guess just specific about the KGW cameras? Yeah, it's, uh, it's motion activated. So, and I believe there's certain parameters they set the uh, surveillance system to like distance wise to activate the camera. I don't know what those are exactly, but it's a motion activated camera. So um, as you're looking at it, it'll sort of stall the time. And then all of a sudden the time will go five minutes faster because something just moved by and it activates it. Okay. And concerning this particular case in Ms. Brophy's van, one, do you see her or what you believe to be her minivan in KGW video? Yes. Okay. So there's two cameras. The first camera, uh, as you see, KGW there, it, the first camera faces sort of towards the uh, southeast, sort of on an angle, and it, it actually captures footage. So a wide span, it captures footage of the overpass. So I believe if you're on Southwest 14th Avenue and uh, Southwest Jefferson Street on the east side of the overpass, you can turn on the Jefferson Street on the one-way street to Jefferson right or uh, westbound and you can see that in the video uh, the video is activated at approximately I think it was 7 a.m. or 701 a.m. and you see a minivan that's driving across the overpass on Jefferson westbound from 14th Avenue across the overpass towards the KGW area uh, it's a very quick uh, image of it moving and then it stops and then you go to the second camera that actually points directly south of KGW's business and points directly at the driveway and Southwest Jefferson Street. So as that van crosses the overpass, the second camera picks it up and it just appears because it's motion activated, parked directly in front of KGW. It's parallel parked. Uh, so it had pulled off, it appeared, to the um, north side of Southwest Jefferson Street, directly in line with the camera, that second camera of KGW, and you can see the van in much more detail. And again, it looks exactly like Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan that we've seen in these, like the Bellagio's video. Um, and at about, there's a time frame of about, I believe it's about 7.01, 7 a.m. to about 7.07 a.m that then the van disappears. So so from your review of this video, and um, are, are you saying that the van was literally parked there for at least approximately seven minutes in front of KGW? Yes. And do you see any movement inside the van, anybody getting in or out? No, I couldn't see anything like that. Okay, so does it appear that the van just literally is parked? Yes, it appeared it crossed the overpass, pulled over, and parked there. And I know, you know, during our investigation and during our video uh, analysis, we would go back. Um, I know I went back and redrove these routes that I was seeing. And when you park, like I did, right at that location, that position where I saw Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan, you can look directly. It's sort of a, there's a grade to Southwest Jefferson where it goes downhill, westbound, the one-way direction all the way down to Goose Hollow Circle at 18th. And you can see down that street and get a visual of the intersection of Southwest 17th and Jefferson. Okay. And so what I want to have you do now is take the pointer and after reviewing all of this video, um, first of all, 
is there anything significant about each one of these videos? Uh, anything significant to you? Okay. Just go through it chronologically? Sure, but answer the question first, I suppose. Is there something significant in each of these videos? Well, on this exhibit here? All, yes, all yes. the videos. Yes, what, there are. What is the significant? Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan. Okay. Could you kind of describe from your review of the video um, the path of travel that you believe Miss Brophy took that morning, starting with the Goose Hollow video at 6.29 a.m. or 6.39 a.m.? Yes. Did you want me to stand? Yes, and please. Shoot? Could, yeah, just kind of okay. slowly follow along what, uh, what path of travel you believe sure. she took, starting with that Goose Hollow facing west. I guess I can do it from here. Okay, so the Goose Hollow platform video through TriMet is right here. Uh, again, just to orient, this is Southwest Jefferson Street. Uh, this is um, in this area, Southwest 20th Avenue here you can see. And the circle is here. OCI is here. So at approximately 6.39 a.m., the Goose Hollow video picks up Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan driving eastbound on Jefferson. So this would have been coming from the 26 highway off ramp. Comes down eastbound on Jefferson, and then it turns right or southbound on 20th Avenue, 6.39 a.m. in the morning. It turns down here, and it disappears for probably about a minute and a half. I know because I've driven this route that this is a dead end down here. There's nothing, you can't get out of there. The van then reappears at this red light here. It has to wait for the light to cycle. And I'm going to stop you right there okay. for one second, show you what's marked as State Exhibit 52. You recognize this? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's uh, Nancy Crampton's minivan at Southwest 20th Avenue. Is this a still image from that Goose Hollow video that you're discussing? Yes. Oh, we have a matter for the court. Okay. We're going to have the jury step out for just one minute. All right, everyone can be seated. Your Honor, I may ask Ms. Weinmiller to jump in on this because she's had one-on-one -on -one conversations with our expert. But it's my understanding that our our video expert, who was um, watching the WebEx testimony of Karen Brophy the other day when the same exhibit was shown to Karen Brophy, and she was asked to identify both the van and our client, that our expert realized by looking at what was being shown on the screen that the pixelation was not correct. Uh, he indicated to us that it was clear that this is a photograph that had been enhanced, that in fact someone had gone in with Photoshop or some other sort of software and had added pixels uh, where they wouldn't have been otherwise. It's our understanding that the added pixels are based on some sort of software extrapolation. So at this point, we would object to further use of this video because we believe that uh, without this being disclosed to us, that this isn't an accurate depiction of what this car would have looked like from the videotape, the pure videotape, without the added pixels, without the alteration. All right, uh, Mr. Overton. <laughs> I like a good conspiracy theory too, Judge, but I don't know what they're talking about. This is slightly zoomed in on a still image. Can I adding see them? pixels? I mean, well, uh, how how is this obtained? This is from the video. 
just to steal energy. But is it, is it something that you all pulled, or is it? Um, it may have been Kelsey that did that, or it may have been Dead Tech Darren Posey. I, I know that just from, I, and I can't honestly remember who did the actual zoom, but that's all it is. It's a screen grab. It's slightly zoomed in. Uh, adding pixels, I don't know. Um, we certainly didn't ask anybody to, to do that. Is anyone able to tell me, Mr. Overstreet, that that wasn't done? Uh, well, uh, yes, I could bring, you mean have a witness come in here and say, that, yes, we did not add pixels? Yeah. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, then why don't we do this? Uh, because I obviously haven't heard from the defense expert either. So at this point, I have one group of attorneys saying they think it's enhanced, and another group saying they're not, and I, I haven't really heard any evidence on the issue. Uh, I think what I will do is ask that you not use the exhibit for now until we can get some clarity on that point. Okay. Um. And if that means that you need to take a break to have someone come over quickly to address that issue, that can be done. Uh, you know, if you need to use the exhibit with this witness, or you can recall this witness when the matter is cleared up. Yeah, I'm just trying to think what might be more efficient. Um, sure. It may be more efficient to take five minutes and make a couple of phone calls as opposed to recalling the person now. All right. Uh, yeah. Jury's out anyway, so why don't we uh, take a break for five or so minutes and just let us know when you're ready. Okay. okay, we'll go ahead and mute ourselves on our WebEx.
All right. All right, please be seated. I wanted to check before hearing the resolution of this issue. I couldn't recall if the exhibit had already been admitted. It has not. Okay, all right. Uh, all right, so Mr. Overstreet, where are we? Uh, we're to a place where um, defense counsel has raised this issue that they realized last week, so I'm not sure why it's coming up just this moment, but their expert watched on WebEx and determined that somehow this video has been enhanced. Right. No, no, what, I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut you off. But what I mean is, because I, I think I understand their objection and issue, uh, when we took the break, you were going to check to see whether or not uh, someone could be brought relatively quickly to address this. Sure. Um, and I, I guess the reason I was recapping is because that kind of informed how I was asking the questions of the right people. Okay. Um, I spoke with a couple of people that have worked on this case regarding video and photographs and stuff. I can tell you Detective Posey's memory was he has himself paused this image, zoomed in, done a screen grab. What he can't say over the phone is, is that what we're using right here? Um, I, of course, asked him, well, did we ever have this particular image enhanced in any way? He does not believe so. Um, and he certainly didn't ask anybody to do that. It is possible, and this is where I'm going with this, that uh, one of the uh, Forensic Evidence Division people took this screen grab, zoomed it in, and then provided detectives with that. So what we're currently trying to do is identify who that person is okay. to ensure that they would answer that, no, I didn't enhance it, I just translated or turned this photo over. Sure. So I think the, a little bit of the disconnect here is not knowing exactly which image <laughs> or who pulled this image is why we can't necessarily answer that question directly. Okay. I still firmly believe this has not been enhanced in any way. Um, nobody's ever told me that. So uh, it would be a surprise to me. But I think we need to get to the bottom of that first. Um, by content. And that's something we can do over the lunch hour. Okay. I think as far as how to move on and be more efficient with our time, we just want to address State's Exhibit 52 with Detective Merrill right now. And that we'll just simply pull up the video and zoom in on the video. Okay. And Sounds we'll good. Go that way. Sure, I'm fine with that. I just want to put on the record because we'll get our expert here as well. Um, just so that everybody knows what it is that we've been told so that we can chase it down later. Okay. He writes, the one thing I noticed was the use of exhibits 52 and 53, which are images of the van turning and coming out right before Goose Hollow. I reviewed the two exhibits, and they are not an exact representation of the original images from the videos. The resolution of the images from the exhibits is almost four times bigger compared to a similar cropped image from the original video. Both exhibits are 1024 times 576 pixels, but that is the resolution of a full-size image extracted from the video, and the exhibits are cropped images. Both images, both exhibits should be about 275 to 170 pixels. When they increase the size of the images, the software they use adds pixels using extrapolation which is calculating to estimate the color and shades for the original pixels, which will make the borders and transitions a softer color. So that's what we've been told about the technology. Okay. All right. So we won't address the exhibit right now. Uh, we'll see, well, other than zooming in on the actual video. And then <laughs> you can figure out what you can over the lunch hour. Sure, thank you, Your Honor. And just a final note, I, he said states exhibit 53. I heard 52 and 53. And 53. We haven't shown that yet. I don't know how he would have analyzed that. It, he has access to the set of exhibits we were given, so I think he's been going back and trying to work his way through others. Okay, so this is not over WebEx to be determining this. He's determining this on his own. Oh, he's had access to 52. I'm sure 52 he gave us. Yeah. No, I'm saying yes. his observance of it over WebEx, he did not observe 53. But he's at, this is the question. He's actually putting his eyes on them rather than making yes. an estimation through well, WebEx through yeah. an image on a screen. I think mm -hmm. Both things occurred. One of the things I noticed this time, and I'm the last thing from an expert, is that there's actually a resolution shown uh, at the bottom of the screen with these still exhibits. Now, I don't know whether he was queuing off what we're seeing there at the bottom of the screen or something else. 
but that then caused him to go back and look at the original exhibits and explain to us what was occurring. Okay. All right. Why don't we <laughs> bring the jury back in now? Uh, okay. Would you like to hear me do like a closing? No, it's all right. Okay. I will go ahead and I will mute us on WebEx and we will go off the record. All right, everyone can be seated. And Mr. Overstreet, when you're ready. So, Detective, before we took uh, our break there, uh, we were talking about um, the path of travel of Miss Brophy that morning from your perspective in reviewing the video. And you were to the point where you were discussing uh, Miss Brophy turning on to 20th as she headed in into downtown. And then a minute or so later, She's coming back out off of 20th onto Jefferson. So could you kind of pick up there and what you're seeing in that video? Sure. So once she comes back from, sorry, give me a second here. Comes back through from Southwest 20th on the Jefferson. She continues eastbound on Jefferson Street. And then she turns at the circle at 18th Avenue, goes around the circle all the way, stops for a light here, and then continues northbound on Southwest 18th Avenue and out of video range at that point. And that's at about 6.41 a.m. Okay. And then did she kind of go out of any camera view that you were able to collect from that morning? She does, yes. Okay. And uh, when's the next time and location that you see what you believe to be Miss Crampton Brophy? So as I mentioned a little earlier, the KGW video is the next video resource that I was able to find the van again re reappear. And this is at approximately 7 a.m. to 7.01 a.m. where it appears to be coming across the overpass. 
so westbound on the one-way Jefferson Street. And then it appears at that same time, 7 to 701 to park right in front of KGW. And then the van disappears at approximately 707 to 708 AM, according to KGW. And the next time we see the van is by this video here, Affinity Management. It has a camera facing Southwest Jefferson. And that's at approximately uh, 707 to 708 AM. The van continues westbound down Jefferson, where it's next picked up by the Starbucks video, the Bellagio's video, and the Eastside Deli video, all these videos. Uh, and that's right in that time frame still of approximately 7.08 and change AM. We then see the van go through the circle. So it continues westbound Jefferson and continues around the circle. It's picked up by the Goose Hollow video again. The first United Church video picks it up too. Comes around and then now it goes eastbound on Southwest Columbia Avenue. We know that because it does not come through here on the other videos through the circle. We know that because we then pick it up from the PGE count, PGE video further down on Southwest Columbia that points this direction. And you see Nancy Crampton Brophy's van come eastbound Southwest Columbia to Southwest 17th Avenue and turn. So it's now going northbound on Southwest 17th Avenue towards Jefferson Street. And the, the last time you see it on that PG video is at around 7.09. Correct. Okay. So now I want to kind of in correlation with the, the map uh, below that you had previously made those markings on. First of all, um, I think you noted that Jefferson was a one way um, as, as the minivan passes KGW. Correct. All the way past OCI. That's all one way. Correct. And then Columbia is also one way heading in the opposite direction. Heading that's west. that's correct. Okay. So Columbia is one way heading eastbound. Okay. So once you lose the van again on this PGE video at about 7.09, I want to uh, skip forward ahead to when's the next time that you see that minivan on any video? So the next time we see the van after it disappeared, um, it disappeared in the area right here, Southwest 17th, going northbound on 17th towards Jefferson. The next time we see the van is from the Goose Hollow video. Uh, the Goose Hollow video camera, the one that we focus on, faces in an eastbound direction. And you can actually see Nancy Crampton Brophy's minivan at seven, approximately 7.28 AM pull out from the OCI corner of Southwest 17th Avenue. So it's now driving southbound on 17 and turns right or westbound on Jefferson Street. That Goose Hollow video picks up that image. And then we it corresponds with the Starbucks video, the Bellagio's video, the Eastside Deli video, the van continuing. And then it continues to go by the Goose Hollow platform video all the way westbound towards 26. Okay. So I want to focus on that time frame between you losing her on PG video at 7.09 and picking her back up at 7.28. In your opinion, uh, is there a geographical space that she would have had to have stayed in between 7.09 and 7.28? Otherwise, she would have been picked up on cameras? Well, based on where she was last seen, Southwest 17th northbound towards Jefferson and goes out of view, we know she doesn't show up on any of these videos here, the one way westbound Jefferson. So we know she did not turn there. Um, so in my opinion, she must have been somewhere down north, Southwest 17th of Jefferson Street. The only other possibility I can think of is if she may be parked somewhere just to the south of Jefferson on 17th. It's just out of camera view. 
but it appeared the van was continuing to drive northbound when we last saw it. So my opinion is, and this is in conjunction with my opinion on this matter right here, is because the next time we see the van, it reappears coming out of that area, right by OCI, coming southbound on 17th at 728, and turning right or westbound on Southwest Jefferson Street. At 728. 728, yes. Okay. Now, in reviewing this video, uh, specifically I'm talking about the Goose Hollow video facing westbound. Yes. Um, do you also note another vehicle of interest sometime that morning? Yes. Um, at approximately uh, 7.19 a.m., the Goose Hollow video uh, shows a truck that's consistent with Dan Brophy's truck, a white smaller pickup truck that's driving eastbound on Jefferson Street and it turns left or northbound and it's hard to determine but it may have been on southwest 19th or southwest 20th to go toward Madison Street and we know that Madison because I've driven this route and I've turned both those streets myself to see and Madison Street continues through if you want to go to OCI by continuing to take a right on Madison or eastbound, crossing Southwest 18th Avenue. And now you're on that back street of OCI near the administration building, the parking lot for the students. And then Dan could turn right or southbound on Southwest 17th Avenue and park the way he did facing southbound parallel parked on the south side of Southwest 17th. Uh, west side of Southwest 17th Avenue. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> did it appear to you that Dan had actually come in to, at least to the culinary suit on a different path than Ms. Brophy did? It did appear that way. Okay. And you stated that you first see him on that video around 7.19 a.m.? Correct. And uh, just kind of to reiterate, you were able to confirm that the alarm was disabled at about 7.22? Correct. Okay. So yes. Is that consistent with the time and distance that you believe that Dan traveled? Yes, it was. Okay. I think you could go ahead and take a seat. Uh, I want you to look at, I believe you have a copy of this. It's what's marked as State's Exhibit 20. Did you say 20 B? 20 B, as mm. Okay. You have a copy of that? Yes. Okay. Yep. Have you had a chance to review uh, its title, Video Footage, uh, in parentheses, with timestamps legend? Have you had a chance to review this uh, chart? Yes, I have. Okay. Um, did you have input uh, in <clears throat> making this chart? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And is it your understanding that Ms. Kelsey Gway uh, was also the other person that the two of you sort of working together to create this chart? Yes, that's correct. And uh, could you just kind of briefly describe what this chart shows? So this is basically a chronological chart showing all of our video resources that I just referenced on the uh, board there. Um, chronologically, as we see uh, points of interest, so Nancy Crampton uh, Brophy's minivan coming into the area from 26 on Jefferson, and on each chart, for each video resource, it lists the timestamp on the video and then the actual time if the timestamp was different from actual time over on the right in that column. So you can clearly see what time it really is and what time the video stamp set. Okay. And so on each of these, you've had a chance <clears throat> to review? Yes. And do you agree with what is on this document? I do. Your Honor, we're not going <clears throat> to move to admit this right now. We will wait until... Uh, Ms. Gway testifies. Um, okay, so as you know, kind of switching gears a little bit, uh, as part of your investigation, obviously video collection is a big piece of that. Um, but what about cell site location information? Is that a tool that detectives routinely use in their investigations? Yes. Uh, in today's age, uh, that's a huge part of law enforcement investigations. Uh, tracking cell phone tower data to see where people are located during a specific time frame if we're able to. And I know it's maybe common to say to, to track where people 
are, but specifically you're really looking where their phones are. Correct, okay. yes. And uh, was that a investigative tool that you utilized in this investigation? Yes, it was. And uh, specifically, did you obtain warrants uh, for cell site location information for both Nancy Brophy's phone and Dan Brophy's phone? Yes, Detective Posey and I worked on that and obtained uh, data via search warrants for that information. Okay, and was that to AT&T? Correct, yes. Um, and did you receive a response from AT&T for both Dan and Nancy's phones? Yes, we did. And then what do you do with that information? Do you sift through it and determine what, what it's purporting to be, or do you hand that off to somebody else? Normally, we try to hand that off to an analyst that's more uh, knowledgeable about the data, that works with it frequently, and can analyze it for us, and then give us the information so it's in a more clear uh, application so we can interpret it. OK. And did you do that in this case? Yes. And so who did you provide all of that data to? Uh, uh, analyst Kelsey Gway. Okay. And we'll discuss with her about the results. Um, Okay, I think I just have one other question regarding the video, uh, kind of like the cell site location information. Is it um, common for you to collect a lot of video, just kind of collect whatever's available, and then also hand that off to an analyst to, um, with direction from what you're looking for, to analyze the video? Yes, yes, that is common. And did you do that in this case as well? We did, yes. Did you also hand that video off to the same analyst, Kelsey Gwe? We did, yes. And then instead of just handing it off and saying, tell me you know, what's in this video, do you actually continue to work with her to help identify what it is that you're looking for in the video? Yes, uh, Kelsey becomes a huge part of the investigation and provides uh, very vital information with her background to be able to, um, you know, we, we want to chronologically follow these vehicles or points of interest in this investigation. Uh, their location, the time frame that they're moving through the area, how many times they're doing that. And uh, so she assisted us with a lot of that information. Okay. And we'll discuss with her about those results as well. But I think that's all I have for you at this time. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, uh, cross-examination. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective Merrill. Good morning. You arrived at the crime scene at about 9.15 a.m., is that right? Uh, I, I arrived about 9.35 a.m., okay. actually. So yeah. you'd been called out to the crime scene at 9.15 and then arrived at 9.35? Correct. And um, did anybody let you know what had occurred prior to your arrival? Were you briefed at that point? Um, I initially talked to my supervisor, Detective Ken Wadham. Uh, and I recall him giving me what he knew at that time frame, that there had been a, a culinary instructor that had been shot and killed. Um, do you know when the, well, first, let me ask you this. What's, a, what's the P, I might get the letters wrong. Is it POI or PIO? Uh, Public Information Officer for Portland. And, and who is that? Uh, we have... Several now, I think back then it was probably Sergeant Pete Simpson, I believe. And uh, have you have you made yourself familiar with the, the VOEC recording, the radio traffic that was occurring between the officers prior to your arrival? Um, I have listened to it before, yes. And are you aware that at 8.40 a.m. dispatch was sending POI Sim Simpson to the scene? Uh, I didn't recall that, no. Uh, are you aware that at 8.40 a.m. dispatch was saying that they would send out a press notification because there was a cameraman on scene? I, I don't recall that, but okay. And have you reviewed any of the media accounts uh, to, to familiarize yourself with what information was in the public domain 
by the time Ms. Brophy arrived for her interview? Um, you know, we may have seen some of that later that evening after we came back to the detective division, but we were fairly busy throughout the day, so I don't recall. Did you follow the coverage of Coin TV, for example? I, like I said, I, I may have uh, momentarily, but you know, we were working the investigation, so we were pretty preoccupied, I believe. Do you recall that at 9.31 that the local media was reporting that there had been a shooting fatality at OCI? I recall seeing uh, Sergeant Pete Simpson in the crime scene photographs that we have uh, standing on the corner talking to media. I do recall that. Um, I don't specifically recall hearing that that you know that media publication, I would say. I want to talk to you briefly about your um, conversation with Nancy Brophy on June 2nd of 2018. Your interview began, I think you testified at 1047. Correct. Okay. And have, were you here previously to listen to testimony regarding calls that had occurred between Nancy Brophy and Karen Brophy that morning? Yes. Yes, I was. And are you aware from listening to that testimony that the second call that occurred between Karen Brophy and Nancy Brophy occurred at 1044? Uh, I believe that sounds correct, yes. All right. So if Ms. Brophy was being interviewed by you at 1047, uh, do you have a pretty good estimate of about where she was at 1044? Um, I recall when we first greeted Ms. Crampton Brophy, she was standing with officers, uh, Sergeant Pat Kelly and I think Sergeant Roger Axelm uh, between Southwest Jefferson and Southwest Madison on 17th Avenue. Uh, we were parked, um, Detective Posey had the interview van parked just a little bit to the north of them. And I recall going over and greeting her and then we walked to the van. Is it fair to infer then that when Ms. Brophy received the second call from her mother-in-law that she was standing with the Portland police at the crime scene? It's very well possible. You've testified that uh, after your interview with Ms. Broby that you thought the timelines were clean and clear and that there were no inconsistencies. Is that right? I think overall, considering the conversation, yes. Okay. Do you recall having a meeting with the prosecutors in this case back in August of 2018? Uh, a meeting with the prosecutors? Mm -hmm. Ms. I'm... Snowden, uh, Ms. Herman, Detective Posey, and you? I believe I do, yes. It would have been 822 at 1100 hours. Yeah, I don't remember the times, but I, I think I remember a meeting like that, yes. Okay. And do you recall at that time that they talked to you about doing an, a, a second interview of Ms. Brophy? Yes, I do recall that. And one of the things that they wanted you to clarify at that time would be the correct timelines. Uh, that's possible, yes. You never did a second interview of Ms. Brophy, or did you? No, we did not. During that interview, uh, or that team meeting with the prosecutors in this case, they asked you to do one other thing, and you made uh, handwritten notes regarding what they were asking you to do. Is that right? Uh, I may have. And you recall at that time that the prosecutors wanted you to have objection, Your cases. Honor. We're going down a road of hearsay. We let a little bit of it go. I actually have an objection to the previous question. All right. So the objection is hearsay. Your Honor, I think that we're talking about this officer's state of mind, which apparently was very relevant during direct testimony. And we're also talking about the quality of his investigation. If he's being given direction by the DA's office. I object to the Stephen objection at this All time. All right. So I'm going to have the jury step out for a minute.
I heard the portion I heard of the question was, do you recall the prosecutors asking you to? That was the point where the objection came. Let me hear what you, I, I'm not asking you to answer this. I, I want to hear what the rest of the question would have been. Yes. Detective Merrill, do you recall the prosecutor, do you recall preparing a checklist during this meeting with the prosecutors? Well, no, no, a minute. That's not what the question was. The, the question had to do with what a prosecutor asked you was yes. the way I heard it. And I'm backing up, Your Honor, as long as I'm just making a proffer. I can do that with the jury as well. Okay, all right. So, so now you're asking about a checklist, so I guess I'll hear what the answer is. Um, likely, I probably jotted down ideas, things that were being spitballed in a meeting on a, you know, the continuing investigation. And do you recall that one of the items on your checklist after meeting with the prosecutors was to swap the casings for DNA because there was a new technology that New York State Crime Lab was using? I don't recall specifically the conversation of that, um, but it's possible we talked about it. Well, you wrote it down as number six. Was that, was that something that you planned to do later on? Well, again, spitballing ideas, and we were interacting and talking about benefits, pros and cons of things, and whether we could do it or not. But you didn't do that in this case? Didn't do? Swab the DNA casings. For no, we did not. All right, so, so, so let, let me just pause it for a minute. The original <laughs> objection was the hearsay of what the prosecutors were saying to him. It sounds like the questions are now being reworded to ask more about uh, after the meeting, did Detective Merrill have a list of potential things that he would do? Uh, so I guess I'm wondering, as it's currently being asked, is there still an objection? Because I would sustain the objection to the original question. Sure. I, I don't really have an issue with this. She's just asking him about how the investigation proceeded. Okay. I, I think that's fair. My, so I think the hearsay issue is probably resolved. My other issue, Your Honor, why I really wanted to jump up is because Ms. Maxfield asked the detective about the idea of a second interview. And I believe that's opening the door to something that they probably, it's a very sensitive issue. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I will say, Ms. Maxfield, I don't know at what point in time your client got an attorney uh, or why there wasn't a second interview. Uh, I know this was at an August 2018 meeting. Uh, so I, I don't recall at what point in time Ms. Brophy was arrested. What point in time was she arrested? She was arrested on September 5th. Your Honor, I All think right. that from a prior hearing, what we know is that uh, Jane Klaus, who was Ms. Brophy's attorney, contacted the prosecutor's office and contacted uh, the police on that morning at uh, sometime around 8 o'clock in the morning that they then met, uh, if you'll recall, there was a handwritten note where Jane Klaus's name was at the top of De Detective Merrill's notes. And it was after that point that uh, our client was arrested, not re-interviewed. Well, there was an attempt to re-interview her, actually. Was she was taken into a room and videotaped and had to assert again. But okay. that would be the timing. Well, so on the timing, though, you've asked a question about whether or not they, they re-interviewed her at this meeting on August 2018, I think what I'm hearing now is that she was represented at that point. I don't think there's any evidence at all of, with regard to whether she was represented in August of 2018. I think that the first indication that there was representation was in September of 2018. Okay. All right. All right. Just making sure. All right. I just make sure I'm understanding the timeline. Uh, and do you agree with that timeline? I Mr. don't. You do not? No. We took this up in motions at some point, Your Honor. And what had occurred that morning of September 5th is that the prosecutors got together with the detectives, uh, including Sergeant Wadham, to discuss that second interview, attempting to get a second interview. Um, we were gathered at the Portland uh, Central Precinct that morning. Uh, it is true that we got some communication from Miss Claus, but nobody saw it until later that day. Oh, I see. And that, that was the issue earlier that, yes, she did reach out. I mean, we agree. There's no dispute on that. But nobody saw it until later. Miss Brophy was arrested uh, sometime, I believe, early afternoon, if I, my memory serves, and then brought back to Central Precinct, attempted an interview where she invokes, and uh, that's the end of the, that. So I, I disagree with the timeline as far as 
detectives and or prosecution being aware that she was uh, represented, um, I can represent that we did not believe that at that time. Well, I, I, I didn't think that Ms. Maxwell was saying that you were. I, I guess let's just bring it back to you, you started by saying you had some concerns that the door was close to being opened on something. Uh, why, why don't you explain your concern? Sure. So uh, I believe what Ms. Maxwell's attempted to do is uh, sort of uh, bring into question the quality of the investigation by questioning Detective Merrill about things he could have done or was thinking or not doing or anything like that to include a second interview. I think leaving the jury to wonder why there's not a second interview. Um, and what, why didn't the detective do that? And that's what she's bringing up. And I think that that opens the door to Detective Merrill saying, no, I did try to interview her, but she refused to talk to us. Um, whether the invocation is something that is the jury should actually hear or not, I, I agree. Maybe there's something to be hashed out there. But the fact that he did attempt to re-interview her, I think, is becoming relevant given this line of question. You know, I think, I think just the opposite. First of all, I, I, the timing, I think, is not as counsel suggests, but this really doesn't have to do with what happened on September 5th. This has to do with what the prosecution and law enforcement believed was still kind of fuzzy as of August 22nd of 2018. Uh, the officer has testified that he thought there were no inconsistencies, and the timeline is very clear after Ms. Brophy's statement. We disagree with that, uh, but I think the fact that after meeting with the prosecutors on August 22nd, Detective uh, Merrill made a note to himself that he needed to go over everything in the timeline again. Uh, I think that the jury can infer from that, that contrary to the testimony that they've heard on direct examination, that the police weren't clear based on what she said, that they had a clean timeline and they wanted a second questioning. It has more to do with his frame of mind, his state of mind. I, I, August of 2018, rather than our client's invocation of counsel in September of 2018. Just to make sure I'm clear on the timeline, August 22nd is this meeting, 2018. After the meeting, the state becomes aware that there's an attorney representing Ms. Brophy or possibly representing Ms. Brophy that day? No, not until later in the day on September 5th. Is on September 5th? That's when the state became aware that she was possibly. Okay, there. so between August 22nd to September 5th, there was no other attempt to interview Ms. Brophy, is that correct? That's correct, that between those okay, two days. All right. Okay, uh, I understand the state's concern. I do think defense has to be careful uh, how much further, if at all, they want to go with that particular line of questioning. Uh, at this point, I don't think it opens the door, but but I, I can see the danger. Uh, I'm I have sustained the state's objection to the original question about what prosecutors said to Detective Merrill. It's my understanding it's going to be reworded as to Detective Merrill leading leaving with a checklist. And to the extent uh, you want to question him more about the swabbing of the. Um, shell casings, I think that's fine, but to the extent you want to ask him about a second interview, I think you're, you're getting pretty close to being able to explain why a second interview wasn't done. I think uh, that's something you probably want to be pretty careful with. So with that, let's bring the jury back in. Uh, no. uh, we're going to go ahead and go off record briefly, and I will go get the jury.
Thank you. Detective, when we left, when we last left off, you and I were having a conversation about a meeting that occurred between the police in this case and the prosecutors. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And that was a meeting that occurred on August 22nd of 2018. Correct. And uh, as a result, or maybe during that meeting, you created a checklist of investigative steps that you wanted to pursue? Again, yeah. When I'm taking notes, ideas that are popping up in meetings, I'll jot them down so I can remember them later to review them, interface with other colleagues, and talk about. And one of the things that you noted here was that you wanted an interview in which you could, quote, go over <clears throat> everything again in the timeline. Is that right? Um, I think that's definitely possible, yes. And specifically, you wanted a clear idea of the timeline that morning. Um, I think to talk about everything again to make sure there wasn't something different from the video we were looking at. Another thing that was on your checklist was that, that uh, it says DNA on casings, new technology, OSP lab. Is that right? Um, it sounds like it. I, I don't remember, but I can recognize my notes from here. So yes. So one of the things that, that you were talking about in August of 2022 was whether DNA could be lifted from the casings, uh, from the crime scene. August of 2018. Uh huh. Um, so I, I believe oh, my question is, is that something you were discussing on that day? I know you said 2022. I was just oh, making sorry, sure we were on the same thing. Okay. My question is in August of 2018, were you discussing with other police officers and with prosecutors swatting these casings to get DNA because there was new technology that the Oregon State Crime Lab was using? I think somebody must have mentioned it in the meeting for me to write it down. Yes. And you listed it as number six on your checklist. Um, Sure. Let's talk then uh, again about Ms. Brophy's uh, conversation with you on June 2nd. You, you described this as a death notification. Correct. Uh, you, you haven't described it as an interview of Ms. Brophy. Well, death notification, I haven't described it, I don't think, as an interview, but it's also an information gathering to help us in the case, the closest person to the deceased. I understand. Um, but, but is it fair to say that during this conversation with Ms. Brophy on the morning of June 2nd, that mostly what you were talking to her about is Dan Brophy's routines uh, and what one might expect Dan Brophy had done on that morning? I would say a good portion of it, yes. So she was being directed to explain to you things that Dan Brophy had done. Uh, some of, yeah, some of the content was that, yeah. Um, do you recall Detective Posey asking this question? Um, what time did he leave this morning? Yes. Do you remember Ms. Brophy saying he left? I'm going to say 7-ish, I mean maybe 7.05, but somewhere in there, that's about the time he normally leaves. Yes, I recall that. You asked what time, uh, Detective Posey asked what time you guys were up this morning or anything. The answer was, he's up early every, every morning. Correct. So in each of these questions, she's providing you what Dan Brophy normally does. Is that right? In those questions, correct. Uh, when, Bro when Detective Posey asked whether Dan Brophy was an early riser, she said he gets up and he has his little list of things he does. You know, he walks the dog, he feeds the chickens, that kind of stuff. Correct. Again, she's describing for you the routines of Dan Brophy and what he normally does. In that in that summary there, yes. You asked how, basically how long it would have taken him to get to OCI from the house. Correct. And again, she reconstructs and says, well, there's, it's Saturday. There's no traffic, or most Saturdays, you know, so I would say 10 minutes from our house top. Correct. So again, she's reconstructing just based on what she knows about where they live, how far OCI is, and what a Saturday morning might be in terms of traffic. 
about how long it would take Dan Brophy to get to OCI. I would say, yeah, and some of those questions, yes. You asked what he might have done that morning. Uh, Detective Posey did. I'm sorry, OCI. can you say that again? Detective Posey asked Ms. Brophy what Dan Brophy might have done at OCI that morning. Sure. Mm -hmm. She responded, I would guess yesterday, oh, or if he'd been there before, I'm saying, she would guess that he was working on the carts. Yes, I recall that. You asked her whether Dan Brophy was the person who typically opened up in the morning. That sounds correct. The answer was no, Yadu is. I, yes, I recall her saying that. And again, she's reconstructing events based on uh, <clears throat> what she knows or doesn't know about her husband's routines. To some of the questions, yes. You also told you that um, Dan had worked at OCI for 12 years and had been working with the same group of people for over 25 years. That sounds right, yes. She told you that I know all these guys at OCI. Yes, I remember that. I get there. One of the other things she told you about was that uh, this was a live fire day. Yes. You hadn't heard that phrase before she mentioned live fire, had you? Um, unless I received it in a debriefing, I don't think so. told you that she had not slept well, but that she woke up when her husband came up to take a shower? Yes. And again, she was estimating what time that would be. She said, well, that would have been uh, 6.50, 6.45. I remember her saying those times, yes. And you, you didn't ask her how she was able to fix those times? No. But again, she was being reconstructive. In her answer? Uh, in the overall context, it was consistent to me. Did you ask him more about the leak that she'd asked her husband to fix? Um, I believe she explained it to us that she gave some detail. So I don't think we had further follow-up questions about it. Do you know where that fit within the timeline? Based on what she told me, being alert and awake by 6.45 to 6.50, uh, she had woken up because he was taking a shower at some time when he was up there. My understanding was that she had that question for him if he had worked on the leak. And what? then he got dressed and left at 7.05 to 7.10. One of the other things you asked her about what he might have brought, Dan Brophy might have brought with him to OCI that morning. She described his uh, glass of tea that he always carried. Yes. But she also told you that he would have a red book bag that he took with him always. Yes. Did you find the red book bag? Not to my knowledge, no. You reviewed the video in this case, is that right? Yes. And um, in spe specifically, you have personally reviewed the video from the Affinity Camera One, is that right? Uh, is that the one facing Jefferson? Yeah. One, yes. Affinity Camera One, it's the one between 16th and 17th facing Jefferson. Yes. Um, I wanna show you some parts of that video, but before I do, was your purpose in looking at the video to determine who was within the area of OCI on the morning of June 2nd? Uh, part of it, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so when you determine that someone had come into the area of OCI, did you also then look at cameras to figure out whether people had left the area of OCI? Yeah, there were uh, myself, Detective Posey, um, Detective Winters, a few of us that worked on that, yes. Council, I don't know if this has been marked as a plaintiff's exhibit, the um, Affinity Camera 1 video, but we have marked it as Defense Exhibit 231. Are you talking about the back parking lot? Yeah, the video that... It's been admitted as State's Exhibit 14. For right now, we'll call that Exhibit 14, but for right now, I'm going to guide our person by calling it Exhibit 231, even though it's a duplicate. I don't know what you're about to show. Um, I would like, Mr. Breton, if you would, would, to show Detective Posey the video that we've described as 231.1 that occurs from this Affinity Camera 1, Part 1, between 6.50, a.m. and 6.53, a.m. That would be the timestamp time. The actual time being between 6.38.26 and 6.40.59. Seen this video, Detective Merrill? Yes. Detective Posey, who was the gentleman with the, uh, did you identify the gentleman with the, the blue recycling? It's Detective Merrill. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. So I believe that appeared to be consistent with uh, Oscar Taylor, a subject that had been uh, mentioned um, by an employee named Mr. Ferret, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, that worked or was aff affiliated with uh, the uh, potluck business. Um, and we also saw that same person, I believe it was the same person on the Bellagio's video pushing the recycling can. Okay. My question though is, did you determine it, it looked as though the man with the, with the recycling, who have you, you have now identified as Oscar Taylor, had some sort of words or some sort of a, an interaction with another gentleman who was walking up the street? Yes. Did you determine who that other gentleman was? Um, I I believe from our interview that Detective Posey and I had with Oscar Taylor, he mentioned having some sort of a verbal argument with another uh, white male that was sleeping in the same area as him. And that's who you think that's who you think is depicted in this video. I'm not sure, but it's possible. Before I show you the next video, I'm wondering if I, with the court's permission, if I can approach. That you can approach. Um, just sort of going to where are we, are we still talking about Exhibit 14, Defense Exhibit 231? Are we talking about the same video? 
Your Honor, this is the video that State has marked as Exhibit 14. Right, but she says before I show you the next video, I just want to make sure. Are we still talking about this video? Um, no, we can take this video down, although I would move to admit it. I think it's actually in. I just want it because it's, it's easier to view in its, in its um, kind of cutout portion. I would move to admit Defense Exhibit 231.1. Any objection to Defense Exhibit 231.1? No objection. All right. It's admitted. I just want to ask you, Detective Merrill, about um, State's Exhibit 96. And State's Exhibit 96 shows the Lincoln tracks. Is that right? Correct. Yes. And right here on this side of the Lincoln track, it's kind of a gray out area. Do you know what that is? I think that's the bleachers. So these would be the bleachers that people have described <clears throat> that um, that face OCI. Uh, yeah, the back of them. Okay. Yes. And this property right here, this is uh, the what used to be called the police property room. Yes. Now between these bleachers and the police property room is an alley that cuts all the way behind this police property room and comes out on 16th. Is that correct? That sounds accurate, yes. Did you ever walk this alley? I drove back into that area uh, from the 16th Avenue side and looked at it in detail, and I also looked at it from the 17th Avenue side. You can't drive through here. No, I drove to the end of the streets and observed that area. But yeah. a person can walk from here. In fact, a person could actually walk all the way through here, could they not? I believe so. There's a lot of what I recall, uh, I don't know if it's trash or debris, but like, um, landscape or bushes or something like that. I want to show you now what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 231. Again, it's this affinity camera. The timestamp on the camera is 7:30:33 to 7:31:08. The actual time would be 7.18.09 to 7.18.44. That's not the video. See the gentleman on the far side of the street there? Yes, I see two. You saw two gentlemen. Yes. One gentleman was uh, walking up the sidewalk. The second gentleman in the lighter hoodie was following. Yes. And it appeared that the second gentleman in the lighter hoodie was actually gaining on the first walker. Yes. And at some point, they disappear into those trees. Correct. And when they disappear into those trees, they would be a kitty corner to uh, or just across the street from OCI would they not I mean there's a little more time I think you have to get through those trees I think uh, when you actually hit the intersection it's more to the upper left corner there where you see the lighting of that building I think it's closer to that area the, the second gentleman who's in pursuit of the first gentleman or who's gaining on him do, do you know where that well, first of all, did you identify that gentleman? No, we did not. Did you make any effort to identify him? We made efforts to identify anybody in the area that was suspicious. What uh, steps did you take to identify that man? So with that subject, we watched the video. Um, he didn't stand out to us uh, because nothing really happened in that caption of the video. He is in the area along with several other people that are in the area walking all directions. During this time that you were analyzing video, if you saw someone come up 
and it being visible on the affinity camera one, would you then look to determine whether that same person came into view on the Starbucks video or the East Side video or the Bellagio's video? We were attempting to do that, yes. You were not able to locate the second gentleman on the Starbucks video, the Bellagio video, or the East Side video after he disappeared into the trees, were you? That's correct. I don't recall seeing him in those videos. You don't know where he went? No. Oh, yeah. I know you've already done this, but I wonder if you can't show the jury where this affinity camera is uh, that we're viewing. Can you show them on the map? That little star there. Yeah, it's in that, it's like an L-shaped building, and it's in that corner facing okay. out towards Jefferson. So it just goes across the parking lot and then captures all the way across Jefferson. Yes, as you see in the video here. I want you to look now, if you would, at uh, the same perspective from the Affinity Camera 1. This time the time... Oh, I'm sorry, you can see. Is that good? Uh, this time the timestamp says 7.35.48 to 7.36.54. The actual time would be 7.23.24 to 7.28.11. Okay.
I think it stopped. Were you able to identify the individual in blue shirt across the street? No. This individual is there for what about uh, six minutes? Um, probably. Yes. And and at some point he walks back toward OCI. Uh, yes. In fact, he does that a couple of times. He's sort of walking back and forth, yes. Uh, and he's just sort of hanging out in this area. Mm -hmm. Eventually, he walks eastbound. Is that right? Uh, at the end of the video, I think I saw him go that way, yeah. Uh, so if, if he were waiting for something on Jefferson, the traffic would have headed westbound. Uh, correct. And if you didn't identify him, you weren't able to determine what purpose he had for being there over the se those several minutes? That's correct. You originally gathered video from this affinity camera that went generally until, do you know the time frame that they originally provided or that you requested? For that affinity camera, did that the, go from 6.30 to 7.30? Um, I think he ended up giving me uh, more than that. I think there was more time frame than that. Later on, the people at Affinity actually sent you additional footage? Um, that may be correct. I want to show you what we've marked as Defense Exhibit 232, which is the Affinity Camera Part 2. And I believe it runs from 8.48.44 to 8.52.18. And the actual time would be 8.36.20 to 
I think it's Josh. Were you able to identify that individual? No, I wasn't. I remember reviewing this video, though. And as you reviewed it, this is an individual who's hiding behind that wall. Well, he's definitely sitting there, crouched down. He seems to be very aware of the police cars that are going by. Yes, he does. And in fact, when police cars come by, this guy kind of he looks, peeks over that little wall and then takes himself back out of view. Yes. Were you able to determine what he was doing with his backpack as he was hiding behind that wall? No, it looked like he was uh, looking at something, uh, maybe took something out, put it back in. It's hard to tell. Do you know whether anything was left behind? No. We can take that down. Thank you. You testified yesterday on direct that you thought any theory that a homeless person might have shot Dan Wilkie seemed hard, far fetched. Correct. Is that right? Do you recall in June of 2018 going to interview Jack and Karen Brophy? Yes. Uh, and that was on June 27th of 2018. That sounds right, yes. And that was an interview that was recorded? Correct. You were there with Detective Posey? Yes. And at that time, you actually talked to uh, Jack and Karen Brophy about uh, the transient population that was within the area? Yes. And you remember telling them, because uh, obviously, though, the Oregon Culinary, as you know, because you, you've worked down there, the Culinary Institute had a lot of transient homeless people, especially in the last few years that are really, and then you got interrupted. And then you said, well, because the train is right there, I mean, I say a lot. I mean, and you compared it basically to the, the homeless population that was occurring down on the waterfront. That sounds fair, yeah. So at least when you're interviewing Jack and Karen Brophy, one, it, it seemed reasonable to pursue a theory that perhaps um, Dan Brophy had been assaulted by a homeless person. Absolutely. We kept that open from the beginning. You'd been, you had, uh, re you didn't interview all the OCI people, but certainly re you reviewed all the interviews of the students and faculty that occurred. Yes. And on June 2nd, uh, various students and faculty described people that they thought were unusual or who might be concerning who'd been hanging out in the area. Sure. And uh, do you recall that Cl Clorinda Perez talked about... Uh, Your Honor, I have a question in aid of objection. All right. That is, uh, I guess, a statement first, which would be, as long as we're not getting into what individual students, especially ones that have testified and were subject to cross-examination, I don't have any problem with the line of questioning, but uh, if we're getting into blatant hearsay statements, I would object to any uh, hearsay. Your Honor, it wasn't hearsay when it came on direct. I'm going to talk to him about things that he learned and what he did in response to the information that he had. Uh, one of the things that he learned were people that OCI students and OCI staff thought were concerning, and I'm going to ask him whether he determined who those people might be and whether he followed that lead. All right, so if you're asking him about specific people he determined might be of concern and what he did with that information, that's fine. But to the extent you're asking him what a witness specifically said to him, especially one who's already testified, I'd be inclined to sustain the objection. I want to ask him about specific people who were described by right. people who were there. Clorinda Perez talked to you about two guys and a girl who always camped across the street. Objection. I think you just... Uh, yeah, I, I think I did too, Ms. Max. But you can't ask him what people, what specific people said to him. I don't see how it wouldn't be hearsay. But if you want to ask him about individuals that he received information on and whether he followed them up, I'll allow that. Okay. Did you learn about two guys and a girl who had always been camped under the bleachers there at Lincoln High School? but who had disappeared on the morning of the crime? I recalled hearing about um, there being transients in the area, some that camped in the area, and I do remember something about under the bleachers. Do you recall hearing about two guys and a girl who had always camped under the bleachers who were no longer there on the morning of the crime? I don't recall that. Your Honor, objection. She's asking about specific things people told her, not about what he's doing with can, she can ask what he's, Detective Merrill is investigating, but not 
drawing out specific statements from the students. It's better. I, I, I am going to sustain that objection and ask that you rephrase or move on to another area. Did you investigate or, or attempt to identify two guys and a girl who'd been camped under the bleachers but were not there on the morning of the crime? We attempted to identify anybody in the area that was suspicious or that could have been related based on our interviews with several staff members, students. We remained in the area for days, continuing to ask businesses, civilian witnesses, people that had video cameras about anybody that was suspicious that they knew of. The one person who really turned up was Oscar Taylor. We found him. We interviewed him. Another person I discussed already who showed up from Sophia Clark was a uh, small, slender African-American male. Let me just stop you for a minute. I know that there's a lot of things you want to tell the jury, but I just wanted to ask you whether you were able to identify the two guys and the girl who had always camped under the bleachers but had gone missing on June 2nd. I don't, know who, I don't know who those people are, no. On June 2nd, there was a description of, 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 of a homeless man who had been routing through the recycling across the parking lot from OCI while the students were waiting to be admitted. Do you recall that? I recall hearing that, yes. And this person was uh, a person who was around five foot ten, African American with a gray beard. So I don't know for sure if that's Oscar Taylor. Um, Oscar Taylor seemed a little bit stockier to me but we did not identify a second African-American male with that description from any of the witnesses in the area. And, but what you'd been told by the students is that this a person meeting this description had been near the OCI parking lot that morning just before they had been admitted into the school. Right, I believe that was around 7.30 a.m. or seven later than that maybe. On June 2nd, uh, you and Detective Posey received a report of a subject that had been behaving in a hostile manner on the morning of June 2nd. Can you give me a little more detail? Yes, I believe this is, and you called him Todd Fredette. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there was a, re a report from Todd Fredette oh. about someone who on the morning of June 2nd had been behaving in a hostile manner. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and this hostile incident was reported to have occurred at Potluck in the Park? Yes. And Potluck in, in the Park is this, this business that's kitty corner to OCI? Correct. Across Jefferson Street. And it was reported to you that, that, that this hostile subject was named Oscar. Objection, Your Honor. I can't believe I have to make this objection again. She's doing it once again. Yeah, she he's wants to ask the detective. To if she wants to ask the detective what he did with this information. All right. I'm going to instruct the jury on this, and I want to be clear. You, you can, I'm going to allow the question, but for the jury's consideration, you can only consider it for what it prompted the detective to do or not do, not whether or not it was true, the information he was receiving. So with that, I'll allow the question to be asked. It was reported that this hostile individual was named Oscar. Correct. And it was reported that this hostile individual had claimed to have a weapon. Correct. You didn't immediately investigate this lead. We were looking for anybody in the area that day, including that information about Oscar. Uh, Detective Posey took great lengths to try to locate him. It took some time, but we, we found him. On July 2nd at 3.53, uh, you and Detective Posey had a 12-minute interview of a man named Oscar. Correct. And this is Oscar Taylor, is that right? Correct. Um, you were present for that interview. I was. But you didn't write a report. Nope. Uh, you did, however, take notes, is that right? Um, I'm sure I probably did, yes. And uh, let me ask you this. Uh, those notes weren't initially provided to the defense's discovery, were they? Uh, that I don't recall. I thought we gave everything forward, but... Do you recall that we subpoenaed those notes and that the Portland police moved to quash that subpoena? So you mean...
can you rephrase the question? Are you saying when you asked for all of our notes that we didn't give them or that we you actually moved confused? to quash our subpoena? Okay, I didn't, but okay. You, I'm, I'm not following you on this. Well, let's go back. You took notes while Detective Posey interviewed yes, Oscar. Yes, I did, yes. Uh, you wrote down what Detective Posey asked Oscar, and you wrote down what Oscar said in response. I believe, yeah, I summarized the best I could. And then you didn't write a report. Correct, I believe Detective Posey wrote a report. Did you review Detective Posey's report? Uh, yes, I've read it. And um, after reviewing Detective Posey's report, did you make suggestions about changes that should be made? Uh, to Detective Posey's report? Mm -hmm. um, I don't recall that. Do you recall, uh, suggest any, any additions? No, I don't recall that. Have you ever had a chance to compare your notes of that interview to Detective Posey's report? I don't think I went through line by line comparing notes to the report, no. Do you recall Detective Posey asking Oscar Taylor, did you see anything that morning? Yes. And do you recall Oscar Taylor saying, I took Cabernet with Candle? Uh, Objection, it's hearsay, also has no relevance. It goes to his state of mind. It goes to whether this is a biased investigation. This detective. Uh, all right, I'm going to have the, the, the jury step out for just a minute. So you're asking him what this Oscar Taylor person said in response to a question. How is that not hearsay? Here, I'm asking him whether there was bias in the investigation. Detective Posey wrote a report about this. He reviewed the report. He did not suggest that anything should be added to the report, but clearly very important grade material was left out of the report. Um, and that's what I want to question him about. This goes to this witness's bias. This go to, goes to Detective Posey's bias. And it goes to whether this was a fair and unbiased investigation. Certainly the defense has a right to impeach the investigation and whether uh, leads were fairly and completely pursued. If something has been left out of Detective Posey's report, one that he's read and one that he thinks represents the police, uh, the police documentation of what occurred during this interview, I should be able to pursue the details. Okay, your question was, though, wasn't, it seemed to me your question was, what did Mr. Taylor say in response to this question? Well, in a minute, I'm going to ask him whether this statement, I took Cabernet with Cam Candle, made it into Detective Posey's report, because it did not. Does the state want to respond? Like, yes, on multiple levels, I suppose. Uh, I believe that would be a question for Detective Posey, if we're talking about Detective Posey's report and what he did or did not include in his report, I think throwing out the term Brady violation is wildly inaccurate, uh, given that this is a recorded interview, if I'm not mistaken. Recorded? Um, I, I thought you had stated that. I, I, I could be wrong. Okay, so it was uh, um, documented by the detectives. I, I apologize. Um, and I believe Detective Morrell could talk about what he heard in this interview and what he responded to in that interview, but not detect, I mean, whether Detective Posey included something in his report or not, I don't know how that's a question for Detective Merrill. Well, I don't know if he can answer it or not. Um, just as far as they offer proof, why don't you continue with your question so I, I can hear what he says. You're, you noted that Detective Posey asked, did you see anything that morning? And that Oscar answered, I took Cabernet with Candle. 
Do you recall writing those notes? If it's in my, I don't recall it, but if it's in my notes, it should be close. Uh, Detec Detective Posey did not include anything about Oscar taking Cabernet with candle in his report, did he? Uh, not to my recollection, no. And you didn't suggest that maybe the report was incomplete or that uh, this statement should have been included in the report of that interview? You know, during a homicide investigation where we're investigating other homicides, we're all doing different roles. Um, usually that detective who's writing the report uh, does that on their own. Do you recall? Uh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you recall uh, noting in your handwritten notes of that, that Oscar Taylor said to you, quote, lots of crazy guys down there carry guns? Yeah, I recall that. And you put that in your notes? Um, if it's in there, yes. You read Detective Posey's report? Yes. And Detective Posey's report simply talks about the fact that uh, Oscar said there were lots of crazy guys down there. Uh, that sounds accurate. And Detective Posey didn't indicate that what Oscar really said was those crazy guys down there carry guns. That sounds accurate. All right, so l let me pause and ask, as the questions have been asked so far, having heard what the answers are, does the state have an objection? And if so, what is the objection? The, the objection is still here, so, Your Honor. I believe what defense is trying to do is get in statements of Oscar Taylor through Detective Merrill, and they have subpoena power, too. They could just subpoena Oscar Taylor, and we could talk to him. Yeah, I, I, can you tell me how – I understand the bias argument, and this may be statements that touch on two different things, but how is defense not trying to introduce these statements of Oscar Taylor for the truth of the matter asserted, mainly that there are crazy people who carry guns around there? Well, I think the fact that it was deliberately left out of uh, Detective Posey's report and that this detective knew that it had been left out of the report goes to this detective's bias and Detective Posey's bias. It also goes, it totally contradicts this witness's testimony yesterday that, that homeless people don't have guns, that when they get into fights with people, it's with their feet and their hands and in the rare occasion of pocket knife. Well, it does contradict that, but I, I don't see how it isn't hearsay. Um, it depends on the purpose for which it's being offered. Right, but it seems to me it's really being offered for two purposes. To the extent, what I'm willing to do is this. To the extent it's being offered for bias, and I do think there it's admissible for that purpose, I'll allow the questions and answers, but I'm going to instruct the jury not to consider the statements that Oscar Taylor may have made for the truth of the matter asserted. I, I don't know any other way to deal with this. I think it's admissible on one area and not admissible on another. So that's the instruction I will give the jury. Uh, did you want to say anything else, Mr. Overson? No, I think that it probably, I, I agree with Your Honor, I think the question could probably be crafted, but I'm very much in tune to this idea that defense has the ulterior motive of trying to end run hearsay in front of the jury. Um, it seems pretty obvious, actually, from their line of questioning uh, over. I'm not, I'm not attributing any negative uh, motivation to defense by asking the questions. Like I say, I think it can be admissible for one purpose and not admissible for another. So I'll instruct the jury when they come back.
Uh, before the jurors left, there was an objection to some questioning. There are times where evidence can be allowable for one purpose, but not for another. Right, are we on the record? Oh, we are not. All right, so I'm going to repeat myself. I know you heard me, but since we're being recorded, uh, before the jury went out, there had been a question. There was an objection. I was just starting to tell the jury that there are times when evidence might be allowable for one purpose, but not for another. So I want to be very clear with what my ruling is on what you're about to hear. Uh, there are going to be some questions about what Oscar Taylor said to police. You cannot consider those for whether or not they're true. In other words, whatever it is that he said, you can't consider those statements as this isn't evidence that what he said is accurate or true. However, it, it may be evidence that, and this is entirely up for you to decide, uh, that police were uh, biased in the way they conducted the investigation or that they didn't conduct the investigation properly. Those are things for your consideration. So with that explanation, uh, I'll allow Ms. Maxfield to ask the questions. Thank you. And you'll have to forgive me, officer and detective, if I cover turf that we've already covered. But uh, you were present for the interview of Oscar Taylor on July 2nd. Yes. Uh, you did not write a report. Correct. Uh, you reviewed Detective Posey's report. I definitely read it, yes. Uh, you also took handwritten notes during the interview. Yes. Wrote down both what Detective Posey said and what Oscar Taylor said. I paraphrase, not verbatim, yes. Det did Detective Posey ever review your notes? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Did you just suggest any corrections to Detective Posey's report? No. Detective Posey asked Oscar Taylor, <clears throat> did you see anything that morning? And you, what you wrote in your notes, I took Cabernet with candle. If it's, I don't recall it specifically, but if it's my, my notes, I agree with it. Detective? Yes, it is. And is this your handwriting here where it says, I took Cabernet with candle? Cabernet Sauvignon with candle, yes. Yes. When you reviewed Detective Posey's report, he didn't say anything about, I took Cabernet with candle. No. You also noted that uh, Oscar Taylor described for you and Detective Posey about the people in near OCI. Lots of crazy guys down there carry guns. Yes, I recall him saying that. And that's what you wrote in your notes. Yes. But when you reviewed Detective Posey's uh, report, he just wrote that Oscar said, lots of crazy guys down there. I think that's correct. He kind of left out the gun part. It sounds like it, yes. Did you suggest to Detective Posey that a fair report would have included Oscar Taylor's statements regarding the crazy people down there carrying guns? I don't recall having that conversation with Detective Posey. It's your testimony that Oscar Taylor was just kind of eliminated as a suspect because he wasn't in the area at the time of the crime? We, there were two reasons to contact Oscar Taylor because he was in the area around the time frame but he seemed to be moving in a different direction during this tight window of time frame after Dan arrived at the OCI until the time the first students began arriving, which was about a six minute time frame. Wasn't your um, testimony yesterday that, that the video showed Oscar Taylor leaving the area of the Oregon Culinary Institute prior to the incident? I thought he was leaving the area during that time frame, that six minute window going in a different direction from OCI. But you did have the description of an African-American male with a gray beard routing through the recycling bin near OCI while the students were waiting to enter. They did mention that, but the description, the physical description was different. Uh, Oscar's a stout, stocky man. They said, a, well, I believe they said a thin black male. You didn't find another African-American male with a gray beard. I don't recall us ever identifying another individual like that, no. And if the video showed that Oscar Taylor didn't leave the area, would you have eliminated him?
you restate that? Sorry. If the video shows that Oscar Taylor didn't leave the area on June second, at the time of the occurrence, would you have eliminated him? If it didn't show him in the area, would we have eliminated him? Mm -hmm. No, if it didn't show him leaving. The area. If it didn't show him leaving the area, if the video showed that he did not leave the area, would you have eliminated him? It depends. My my memory of the video is that he was moving in a direction that was not going directly to OCI where he could make access to OCI uh, during the time frame before the students arrived and after Dan arrived. One small thing. You testified that when you interviewed Ms. Broby, that your focus was on determining whether Dan Broby had taken a gun to school and perhaps been shot with his own gun? That was one of many focuses, yes. And so your focus during the questioning was whether Dan Broby might have brought a weapon to OCI that he could use to protect himself? Or that he could possibly have it taken from him and shot by his own gun is what we're concerned about. And it wouldn't be reasonable for Dan Brophy to quickly put together a gun kit to protect himself on the morning of June 2nd. It's not a gun kit. It's a gun show gun. So a, an unassembled gun kit wouldn't have helped you determine whether Dan Brophy had brought a gun to school. Can you restate the question? An I'm unassembled confused. gun kit really wouldn't be responsive to whether Dan Brophy had taken a weapon to school to protect himself. Are you referring to the gun that we collected from Nancy Crampton Brophy, or are you referring to a different kit. gun? Okay, so I want to make sure, uh, because the gun I'm talking about that we were concerned about is the one that we were told about by Nancy, not some gun kit we had no idea about. So you talked to her about the gun that he might have used to protect himself. We asked her if she had any guns, and that was the gun she told us about she had. And so we were concerned about that gun, that maybe Dan could have possibly brought it for some reason that we didn't know about. But you criticized for not t criticized her for not telling you about an unassembled gun kit that Dan Brophy couldn't have used to protect himself. I'm simply telling you I didn't hear anything about that when I asked her if there were guns in her possession. You testified that it was while, while the other officers were at the Brophy home that you determined that Ms. Brophy's van had been in the area? Correct. Did you, you asked the officers to take a, a photograph of that van? Correct. But you didn't ask the officers to, for example, check her hands for gunshot residue or anything like that? No, at that point, we weren't sure it was her van. We thought it looked a lot like it, and we wanted to rule it out or or corroborate that that's the van. So one step at a time is the way we were looking at it. We were still in shock. I'm going to go back to Oscar for just a minute. Cause if you were trying to decide which leads to pursue and which leads not to pursue, it would be important to know what just kind of the criminal history of the person that you're investigating. Is that right? Correct. And did you run a record check on Oscar Taylor? I believe either Detective Posey did or I did. I can't recall which one or both of us, maybe. And did you review any of the police reports that the Portland Police had amassed by that time regarding Oscar Taylor and his interactions with police? Yeah, I knew he was uh, aggressive. I knew he was, uh, uh, I believe, would steal things uh, involved in a lot of activity like that. Um, I don't recall anything uh, about gun possession, though. He knew he'd been in prison. Yeah, in fact, we he'd just that. been released from prison just prior to this. Of relevance, Your Honor. Uh, overruled on relevance. He's asking what, what the witness knew, and 
same that he did, I think, but go ahead. To my Aaron judge. Um, I'm asking regarding the criminal history because I think. I already overruled the objection. I'm sorry. I overruled the objection. Oh, okay. As as the question right, stands to so far. Myself, I'm ahead. I should be quiet. Um, <clears throat> you knew that he'd been in prison. I recall in the background check learning that from, I believe Detective Posey told me that, but yes. You knew that he'd been to prison for robbery. I knew there was, yeah, I knew there was a background of robbery, theft, um, and that he was aggressive with police. And it, numerous times, in fact, he'd gone to prison for assaulting police. Uh, that sounds, that sounds correct, yeah. He had felonies that went back to 1989. He had like 15 felony convictions. That sounds correct. And probably... 20 misdemeanor convictions? Probably. And there was rarely a time that Oscar Taylor was investigated where assault wasn't part of what was being investigated. Um, I can't answer that for sure. I don't know. I have no further questions. All right. Uh, redirect. I realize you, you may not finish, but. Let's see what we can do. Okay. Uh, since we're on the topic, Detective Merrill, this is Oscar Taylor, regarding his criminal history, I think you tried to explain, but um, did you find anything on his criminal history regarding firearms? No. Defense throughout the term robbery. Do all robberies involve firearms? No. Is it true that, in fact, the robbery could simply be pushing somebody while stealing a beer can? Yes, it can. In your opinion, Detective, does the fact that Oscar Taylor has been to prison or the fact that he has a felony on his record in and of itself mean that he likely committed a murder? No, it does not. Is that perhaps why you actually investigate leads when you're investigating homicides? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We want to further the investigation. We want to follow up on things like this, um, make contact, talk to a person, uh, try to find out what they were doing that day. Detective, how long do you think you would last in your career field if you just identified the first person, specifically a person of color, in the neighborhood at the time of the murder, and you just jumped to conclusions for that person? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be very successful. There's a lot of discussion about different people in the neighborhood. We can obviously see the video, videos. Uh, your recollection of that morning, it was a Saturday morning, I think you mentioned already? Correct. What about the temperature and the, the climate? What was it like? It was warm. It was nice. Uh, in fact, it got very hot that day later. Okay. And one of the videos that defense showed you was this affinity management one that's a little east of the Oregon Culinary Institute. But I want to focus your attention a little bit farther west near the Bellagios and Starbucks. Mm -hmm. Was that a relatively busy area that morning? Yeah, yeah, it was. There were people walking back and forth, um, transits right there, the light rail, uh, Starbucks on the other side. So, yeah. Okay. And just as a matter of investigating any homicide, I mean, is it your experience that you actually get to identify and track down every single person within a certain radius of the crime scene? No. Is that even further made difficult when you have an area like this, that it's a, on a warm Saturday morning in the summertime, and there's a lot of people around? Yes, absolutely. With legitimate reasons to be in the area? Right. I mean, like was mentioned, there are apartments, condos all around this area. People are leaving those areas. There's people driving through, going to do whatever they do on Saturday morning, maybe work. There's transit. Uh, the light rail is, you know, there's people getting on it and exiting it and walking through that vicinity. Uh, there are houseless people as well. Just as you know, if you walk out and walk down there right now, you'll probably see that too. Yeah. And so uh, defense questioned you on several people that they saw in video, and it sounds like you actually were able to identify some of the people and, and maybe even talk to certain individuals. I mean, just in your opinion, did you feel that you made the efforts that you could 
to identify these individuals and speak with whoever you could. Yes. I feel like we did. I feel like we went the extra mile on this investigation. I feel like we worked our butts off on this investigation. Um, you know, uh, spending lots of hours past, you know, our work day. This was the weekend. We worked all day Saturday. Um, we never got information from a student, an instructor, a civilian witness, a business owner in that area that Oscar Taylor was somebody of suspicion of a murder, that he was out carrying a handgun. We never got any information about any of those other people. We were searching for information about anybody and everybody, and that's part of our investigation to be as open as possible to try to identify anybody, and then we take it a step further and try to go further with that. So I'm going to pause you there, um, Mr. Rovers Street. Now we're a few minutes before 12, but let's let's take our our lunch pause now. Um, we'll be back for the attorneys on the record at 1:30. Miss Lou will talk to the jury about when to come back. Okay.